Ich habe halt keine Ahnung, also ich habe halt auf meinen, ich habe vier Desktops und jeder Desktop hat halt keine Ahnung, so zwei, drei Firefox-Instanzen mit jeweils 20, 30 Tabs. Gut, ich habe halt einen Firefox mit 900 Tabs. 900 Tabs. 900. Alles klar. Ja, und da habe ich halt, da ist halt so ein Firefox und dann hat halt so ein Plugin, was dann mal, war, dass man Plattgruppen haben kann. Da, so ist es ja, auch wieder. Das ist halt nice. Und dann habe ich halt eine Gruppe mit 900, dann habe ich noch zwei, drei andere Gruppen mit 400 und eine gemacht. Und insgesamt so 1000. Natürlich, wie man das so tut, ja, das kenne ich. Ja, ey, keine Ahnung. Ja, ich kann auch noch in die Wip gehen, runterholen, dann wird es zweit. Ich frage mich halt, ob das irgendwie Sinn macht für diese Vorlesungsaufzeichnung. Frage ist, hat das irgendwelche Auswirkungen? Also hat das eine Auswirkung auf die Leute, die das angucken wollen oder Auswirkungen auch für dich? Weil das sind ja auch vielleicht noch die Klasse oder so. Ja, der darf dann nächsten Monat auch. Sollte ich diesen Monat auch oder stellt das nicht dahin? Da bin ich mir gerade nicht sicher. Das, das wäre vollkommen egal, aber keine Ahnung, in dem Sinn, also es ist ja quasi ein Lecture da. Ja, ja. Mm. Also ehrlich gesagt, selbst natürlich ist es nicht so geil. Ja, eben. Also es, es würde die Hausaufgaben machen müssen. Selbst da, ne, die Sache, keine Ahnung. Also. Wie viele habe ich gesagt, braucht man? Neun, ne? Ich glaube. Äh, so, irgendwas. Also, ne, okay, ist ja mal typisch, welche sind wir. Hm? So, das sind halt so die Leute, die, die noch irgendwie Hausaufgaben machen müssen, wobei fünf ist eigentlich unrealistisch, sechs. Ne, also, es geht wahrscheinlich, keine Ahnung, auf, auf dieser Anzahl. Ihr dürft das gar nicht sehen. Das kann ich ja eh nicht, weil ich kenne ja die Filme. Das wird wahrscheinlich sogar gerade gefilmt. Irgendjemand. Ich habe gesehen, ich war ganz oben an der Liste. Ja. Mit elf Hausaufgaben. Ja. An die Leute, die diese Vorlesungsaufzeichnung machen, bitte noch nicht aufzeichnen. Ich glaube ehrlich gesagt nicht, dass die das. Fuck. <lacht> okay, dann habe ich keine Zeit mehr. Also zumindest war das mal so in Mathe, wo das Mikrofon aus oder in anderen Kursen, wo das Mikrofon das aus hat und dann später angemacht haben, dann wurde die Vor also die Aufzeichnung erst von da wurde Verdammt! <lacht> okay, ähm, ja, dann, dann muss ich mich entscheiden. Das macht halt überhaupt gar keinen Sinn, Alter. Was, was, was willst du daran sehen? Also. Ich zeige zeig Ihnen die Sachen. Ja, das ist egal. Komm, dann mache ich, aber dann mache ich auch noch mal kurz das Analysieren der Studie, damit ich das drin habe. Ist das okay? okay. Oh boy. So, um, uh, as we are not too many people here, for everybody seeing this at home, so the plan was to have like 15 minutes um, sample solution for the last homework, 15 minutes analyzation of um, the Steinberg task, which we did last, which we programmed the experiment as homework to this week, to just have uh, the analysis of this, 
and then I have like something short to parallelism in Python and something short to sklearn. And then um, I send out an email um, about the evaluation uh, where everybody got a, a thumb. Um, and I would have spent 15 minutes on that doing the evaluation here. So if everybody looks at this at home, please do the evaluation. You should have gotten an email. If not, please text me. Um, every active participant should have gotten an email. That's about 70. Um, and please fill out this evaluation. We really need this because it's something really relevant. Okay. Uh, then last week, we uh, for the first we had this uh, Steinberg task. So um, the Steinberg item mechanism dash. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to check if the shorter number of humans um, checks stuff in parallel or uh, checks for stuff in parallel or serially. And if it was serial, we even had uh, two different op options. Either it's self-terminating, that means as soon as we found the item, um, we stop looking for it, or exhaustive where even if the first item we searched for is the one we're looking for, we're still looking for the other five for some reason. And what the Steinberg task then basically does is where we present one to six numbers between one and nine, um, and then present a single number, the target, and look, uh, and the subject has to say if the, t if the target was part of the sequence it saw before. Um, this here would be the sample solution, so what um, we were supposed to code uh, was this make design function, which we see here. So, um, as mentioned, so this we need this number selection here because where we in the end we present the numbers one until nine, um, which is just um, because we need that a few times. We had three blocks: the practice block, the first and the second block. So we make this three times to make a new block with the respective name. We um, and then we present one until six numbers. So first we start. First we add the ten uh, one time the, the five for each block, the five sequences of length one, five sequences of length two, and so on, and we have to shuffle the files such that this order is not there anymore. Uh, and then for every sequence length, we have the condition where the new number is either in or not in this sequence, and then for this we need five times two different options in each block. And everything we have five times. I said that you shouldn't only make one trial and clone it because then the sequence would be the same for all of these trials, which is not what we wanted, but we want for every combination of sequence length and if the sequence appears or not, we want five different sequences. Um, and this is why there's this third, or well, up to all four, for loops such that we present um, where the, the, um, the index doesn't matter, but we just want to create five times for each of the combination of these two loops. Um, uh, that's why. Yeah. And then we make the trial, we have the, sec we have the factors length, and if this stimulus appears or not, um, both are here. Uh, and then we, we find one to six numbers of our number selection of one to nine, and then we make, for all of these numbers, we make a new stimulus and add it to our trial. And then we want to check like uh, the target is either in or not in the sequence. So the, we set here the very possible numbers, which is if the sequence is supposed to appear, um, the, the one of the numbers we created here. And if not, it's one of the numbers without the numbers we have here. So the set difference of all possible numbers and the numbers which actually appear. And we had a new stimulus for this uh, in another color because why not? Uh, because such that we can identify this one. Yeah. We had the, stimul the last stimulus to our trial that we did here. We had our trial to our block. For all blocks now we shuffle twice. And what we now have is we have three blocks with, with uh, six times five times two um, uh, trials. And in our practice block, we only wanted 12 ones. And and what I'm doing in this situation is just I delete uh, the 12th one until there is no 12th one. And, uh, and I delete the 13th one, so the index 12, until there is no 12th one. Um, this is the easiest way, I thought, to just 
such that we only have, uh, that we can create the trial block the same way we create the others, and we shuffle the trials such that we're sure that where we don't have only the conditions uh, length one and two in our trial block or something. Uh, with this method, we create a trial block like the other ones, and we just delete everybody, uh, every trial after the 12 months or so that doesn't exist anymore. And yeah, we add every single block to our experiment such that when we conduct it, such that we know how to design. And so this is the overall uh, study. So these are some settings which make it look nicer, the instructions uh, you made the design. And then in the actual experiment, um, well, okay, what we do here, um, we present, first of all, uh, for every block, before every block, there's some text. So before the instruction, uh, before the, the, the practice block, number zero, we show the instructions. Um, between practice and first block, we have a pause. And then between first and second block, we have another pause. And we just show this, this text and wait for the user uh, to press a key. I'm doing this in speed of clock that wait for 1,000 for one second such that uh, you don't accidentally press the key, which happened to me quite a few times. Yeah, and then uh, in our current block, we go through everything in trial, we present a blank screen, we present where we wait, we preload the first stimulus, uh, and then wait for a second, including the, the time it took to preload that, and then we go through all the um, trials, the, all the stimuli of the sequence, which is all but the last one, because the last one is the actual target, and we show it and we wait for 1.2 milliseconds, uh, 1.2 seconds, which is the time every stimulus is supposed to be presented. Then we present the blank screen again, we wait for 1.8 seconds, we present the quick scores, wait for another 100 milliseconds, um, and then we show our final um, target stimulus, and then we wait until the user press one of the response keys, and the response keys we see uh, somewhere at the top. Uh, oh no, in the main, we put the, uh, yeah, those are the response keys, so it's either Y or no. We wait for the keys, we measure the type, so we save what the user thought, we save if that was correct, and that is where well, if the user press yes, and it actually does appear, or no, and it does not appear. And then to save everything we need, uh, we save block name, and then if, if it appears, the response time, and if the user was correct. Such that if we then uh, have our, if we then call that in our main function, where we first preload the black screen and the fixed cross here, um, we make some other things like having the escape quick key all the time, we have the mix keys here, and so on. Um, give our final data uh, file useful uh, names. And then yeah, we save our design because uh, this is needed uh, for the test group. And then yeah, we can call it for start, conduct our experiment, and control it out. Cool. Um, as much for that. And now let's go through the interpretation of um, how do we interpret what the, result, uh, of the results of our experiment. So imagine we have much, uh, a lot of data. So this data here is not from this original experiment experiment because I would have needed subjects and VPs and I, I can't get that from this class. So I converted in a really annoying and long and fashion, I converted, um, so uh, the psychology department had to do this experiment for a class where they actually had VPs, and um, they did this in, in MATLAB, and uh, the data comes from the result of MATLAB file. It's just converted such that it looks exactly the same way it would have looked um, if it was created by this experiment. And that is, we have, in our CSV, well, first of all, the comments of how um, of how our blocks look like, and then in our CSV we have the subject ID, which block it is length, response time, if stimulus does appear, and if um, the user gave the correct answer. Um, 
And now let's analyze this. How do we analyze this? Well, what we said before, um, uh, what we said before is that the, if the recall process was parallel, there would be either no increase or a jumpy increase in response time. That means, so no matter if we have, um, no matter if we have one item or um, six items, uh, the response time would be all, always the same. If the recall process was serial and self-terminating, the response time would increase with every algorithm until the has is actually found. Um, but the slow would be smaller in the conditions where the target is part of the sequence. If the target is not part of the sequence, the action time of sleep occur, the search must be exhausted. So that means for the cases, so in cases where the target is not part of the sequence, you have to go through, if the sequence length is six, all six items, and check all six of them until you notice, okay, the target is not any of these. Okay, so that means if you have six items, you have to look through six items in every single, every single time. If, however, um, the target is part of the sequence, it can either be the sixth item, in which case you have to look through six, or six items. It can be the, fi the fifth, in which case you, can, you have to look only at the first five items. It can be the first, in which case you only have to look at the first one. Such that, so that leads to a curve where, in the end, of course, the response time does increase, but the response time for the condition target is not part of the sequence, increases steeper than if the target is part of the sequence, because on average, it's in a six length list, on average, the target is at position 3.5, right? And not at position six. So that um, the curve is steeper here. And if it was zero and exhaustive, the response time would increase linearly with every item, equally for the condition where the target appears and where the target does not appear. Uh, to show you why that would be the case, um, this here is a, 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 a theoretical um, reaction time. So what we do here is we go through all the conditions we have. I um, I did sequence length here until uh, 20 because only until 7 it's not too representative, you don't see it too much. And, I had, and then I made 100 random trials and now the terminal response time is always, so the response time um, for, the, uh, so for the terminating one, for the self-terminating one, um, the response time is something that's either it's something in between the first and the in the case of sequence of length six six item. So it's something random in between and the non-terminating one or the one where the target is not part of the sequence is always the last one. So it's here time six for sequence length six. So imagine we, we took one hundred milliseconds per item uh, per number of the sequence, and then we have the non-terminal response time here is. 100 times 6, and this here is 100 times some value between 1 and 6, which is on average 3.5. And then if we print those ones, we see that the exhaustive one, or so if we, um, the response time was exhaustive, or non-exhaustive, and but the item appears uh, doesn't appear anyway, then we have the steep curve, steep curve. And if the uh, response time was self-terminating in the was self-terminating, then the conditions where um, the target is part of the sequence, this would be the curve, which has a lesser slope. That makes sense, right? 3.5 uh, versus 6. Uh, okay, um, and then let's analyze our data. Um, for that, uh, experiment provides in the MIST package this data preprocessing but white concatenated data that simply takes um, well a data folder and then um, the, the first few letters of how the, item, how the files in the data folder are called and simply merges them to in this case data.csv so if we execute it this takes all the items which we see here and merges them to one big file and then we use pandas to analyze this file. So let's look at um, how would it look like. Uh, 
Unfortunately, the Jupyter Fighter Lab cannot um, you cannot work with this type of commented CSV such that um, you have to open it in the text editor. Um, yeah, but we see here now we have every single uh, like every single try for each participant, one after the other. So what the first thing we want to do is well, we read the CSV. Pandas luckily provides this comment equals sign, which Rudika told me last week. So this year we don't have to, to start reading at the second line if we know what uh, we tell pandas how uh, what with what sign the comment starts. And yeah, we start by subject ID, we drop non-existent values, and then we rename um, the uh, the columns uh, <laughs> well in a better way. Uh, sorry that I gave them uh, bad names. It's stupid to work with uh, names containing spaces, so we rename them to names without spaces. Um, and then we delete the ones the, where the response time was zero. I have, like I said, the data set was created somewhat artificially from some dump of the MATLAB files. I don't think in a normal, ex so if the data was created in Experiment, then I don't think this line would be necessary. I don't know why some subjects have, for some conditions, a response of zero. Of zero. Wouldn't occur uh, if we did it purely with experiment. Okay, and then the first thing we want to do is we want to know the mean accuracy by subject because what we want to do is we want to rule out participants that just sucked. If a participant has, a accuracy, has an accuracy of 50%, then that participant didn't look at the secrets and didn't do anything, but just pressed random buttons. And we don't want that to be part um, of our analysis. So what we do here is we use pandas to um, where we, we group by subject ID and then get the mean of the correct answers of these subjects. So this here is the mean um, percentage of correct answers by subject. And if we print that, if we print the mean of, of that and the standard deviation of that, we see the mean accuracy is 92%, which is pretty fine, the standard deviation of 0.07. And then some standard way of ruling out um, subjects who are not good enough is to say, well, let's delete every, let's remove every subject who was worse than two standard deviations or three standard deviations worse than the mean. I think I decided two standard deviations here, but that's something you would have to um, talk about with, uh, so if it's a thesis or something, talk about uh, with your supervisor about that. Okay, and now we look, what is the mean accuracy we count? It's 78%. So mean minus two standard deviations is a mean of 78%. And now what we do is we simply delete all the subjects which had an accuracy worse than that which are numbers 16, 140, 230, and 312. So we delete them. We delete all the, the ones, the data of those subjects which were too bad because we don't consider them. Uh, then what we also have to do, the practice block was just there for practice. So we delete every single practice block trial because we don't count them because that was the practice. And then, of course, and then we can drop the uh, correct answer file. Yeah. Um, good. Then what we want is the average response time per combination of length and does a field, ignoring the subjects, of course. Because what we want to do is we want to average over all subjects. So what we do here is we actually average over all subjects. So we group by subject ID the length that if it appears, um, which is now this uh, subject ID. So we got the subject ID here because we need we take the mean of that, and in the end we have for every combination of length that does appear, we have an average response time. If we look, if we get the mean, we set the index. This is what it looks like. So this here is what we want to analyze in the end. Good. Let's start by, um, let's start by just looking how the response times do look. Visual inspection, first thing we always want to do. So what we do here is we print um, the two different conditions, stimulus does appear, so the curves for the two conditions, stimulus does not appear and stimulus does appear. And we see this is the result. So what can we interpret already from this? 
well, we see that this is obviously increasing, right? So with the number of items, um, the re reaction time does increase. So this provides already strong evidence that we probably don't search a parallel. And then we see that we, if the stimulus does appear, we, it looks like a constant less than if the stimulus does not appear. Um, but we can't say that purely by visual inspection. We have to, to make some models to check if that's actually the case. So either now this here has a lesser curve than this here, or this is simply um, an offset which is what we're going to check now. So we have visual evidence that the working memory does not work in parallel. But let's um, go for something real. And for that, we use STATS models produced two weeks ago. Um, and we want to tell the response time from does appear and length. So we want to know if does appear and length were factors which were response which can explain the response time. Okay, so this is our linear, so we want to make a linear model then, model for that. And this here is our research. First thing we see R squared, the um, explained variant is 98%. So using the factors does appear and length explains already 98% of the variance of this data, which is really, really much. Um, so this is already quite a good value, our model does a good job in explaining something. Okay, then what do we see? We see that the intercept with the uh, y-axis is generally 600 uh, x-axis, is 600 something, and if the target does appear, the intercept is simply 60 milliseconds below that. So seeing this provides um, evidence that our, so if the stimulus doesn't appear, it's the, not the, the um, curve, not the steepness, which is different, but simply an offset, which is one of the two options we had at first. Okay, and then the length, so for every um, number, so for every item more in the sequence, we took 40 milliseconds more. And then we have the combined factor does appear and length, which we get in stats models if we use uh, the times here instead of the plus. And that is um, a pretty small and irrelevant value. So how, what's, what is the P uh, value for, for these different things? So that our intercept is that high has a P value of 0.00, 0.00 something. Open up. So this is obviously no coincidence. That if the target does appear, makes it short, like that this here is coincidence, that the people of open 005, which is still highly, highly, highly significant, and that the length has an influence, as the PBL is still of 0, 0.0, so this here is highly, highly significant, whereas the combination of if it does appear and the length is pretty insignificant, obviously. So the p value is 0.75, so there's definitely there's, uh, it's, it's nothing, uh, it's nothing. Okay, so we see the reaction time increases with the number of items by 30, by 43 milliseconds, highly significant, and you can interpret that in the sense there's no parallel processing. Reaction time does increase, p is smaller or something, no parallel processing, we're certain about that. Next thing, when the target does appear, the response of error is on average 55 milliseconds faster, still highly significant. We have P value of smaller open or something. And we do not have an interaction effect, so because this line here was not significant. And with these two factors, we already have 98 point something percent explained variance, which is really much. Okay, now um, we have to do something else because the difference between the conditions appears and does not appear is significant, right? Uh, the response time is 55 milliseconds faster. This is highly significant and because this is significant. We have to look at both rules separately. So we split the positives and the negatives, and let's make a fit for only the positives. Um, the only factor which we have now is length. Okay, and let's do the same for the negative one. Okay, and if we look at the results of this, 
where we see 99% of claim variance, which is really much 96% of claim variance. So this is, in both cases, pretty much. And then we look at the steepness of both curves, right? Because what we wanted to check is if it's simply an offset or if the curves have different steepnesses and different slopes. We see here where the intercept is at something at 42 milliseconds per num per length of this per, per, per so with every increase of the length of the sequence by one, it takes 42 milliseconds longer for the positive ones, and for the negative ones, uh, 41 milliseconds. This is basically the same slope. So there's almost no difference in the slope of the curves. Um, if this difference was significant, it, provide, it would provide evidence for serial and self terminating recurrence. If not, so the same slope could explain both collisions equally, which appears to be the case. 51 and 52 milliseconds is really, really not much. Uh, it would be evidence for serial and exhaustive. So let's look if this um, difference is actually significant. And let's first plot. So, so now we want to plot again because when we, we saw something and we want first we want to make sure ourselves visually is that what I'm doing realistic. So let's look at the two opposing uh, hypotheses. Equal slope with different intercepts versus different slopes. So this here would be equal slope 41 point something with different intercepts, 600 something and uh, 600 something versus 62. And the other possible, the other possibility would be different slopes. So 600 something would be uh, slope 40 something, and 600 something with the slope 42 something. Uh, 500, so this is again minus minus 60. Blah, 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 blah. Um, let's plot all this, and where we see there's basically no difference, right? So what we plot here in um, uh, oh yeah, I make I make another uh, make this model here again because this time I have the plus. So this here is um, the same as the first one without the ejection effects. So this is simply the same thing without this last line here because when we figured out there's no ejection anyway, so we don't need it. And then what we do is we, what do we put in blue and what do we do in orange? Um, One thing is great. So these here are the actual data points, right? We scatter them from uh, our uh, from our prepared um, uh, data point, which is this one. And then in gray, the curve in gray, which is starting a bit higher here and ending a bit lower here, so having a bit uh, lesser slope than the orange one is the one purely for the negative fit, and in this case, purely for the positive fit. So, and the orange one is the one where we have this exact same slope for the positive and negative one. So what we have to see now, if, so what we have to do now is we have to check the difference of, to see if the difference of the entire curve is different. Uh, so we want to check if the entire curve is different or only one condition changed that fact. To do that, we have to look at the individual conditions, which is sequence length one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, separately, testing the difference for every single condition for significance. If we do that, we have to want to only connect, correct the p-values, because otherwise we would have a problem. So there's always a relevant x case indeed, and this is definitely the one for one to one correction. So let's say we somebody said jelly beans cause acne, and then we found no significant difference, so we're at this point here. We say with some certainty that there's no difference, uh, there's, there's not a significant difference between the, the slope of these curves. But now maybe it's just one of these points or one color of jelly bean which actually causes that. What we shouldn't do now is look at every single one with a p-value, with the same p-value we had before, because if so, the likelihood that one of these actually fulfills the criteria is pretty high. Because when, if we have 
20, so if we have a p-value of 5% and we look at 20 different colors, where with a p-value of 5%, where in one out of 20 cases, statistically, we find something which is not there, right? So if we look at 20 different colors, one of these is going to be significant, statistically. So what we have to do here is we have to divide the p-value we originally had, which is 5% here, by the number of conditions we're now looking at. In the case of colors, I think it's 20, I'm not sure I didn't count the panels, um, but they would have to correct the p-value here and have to divide this 5% by 20 for to look at those individually. So what we do, we do the same, so if our original, original p-value was 0.05, we have six different conditions, now we need a corrected alpha, which is 0.008. On to a one correction. Okay, and what we then do is, um, I actually forgot what I'm doing here. I think I'm making a list of all positives and all negative ones. Um, I think I need that later, that's why I did it. Uh, Good. And this here is our then the average times of what? I oh, know I'm just dropping the subject in here for some reason. Okay, I didn't do that. Okay, and then um, what we do here is this uh, Turkey HSD, which is testing exactly what we want to do here. So we have one, so we have a combination of different data points, and to check if one of them was the reason uh, for a difference in significance, we can use this um, Turkey HSD function. Uh, for that, we simply do this multi comparison where we compare for every uh, for every length, we compare the does appear and does not appear because the response time for the does appear and the does not appear condition. And then we simply call this multi comparison the Turkey HSD. Um, we have to say that we use the correct alpha value and then we see not significant, not significant, not significant, not significant, not significant. All differences are not significant. And that then leads to our final conclusion that we do not search a parallel, where we knew it before. And the curve steepness does not differ significantly at all. We assume that we should search exhaustively. Because these curves here have the same, the same slope, we search exhaustively no matter if the item occurs or not. And this is our interpretation. And if we use this reasoning in a paper, it would probably be correct. Okay, um, what I just noticed is that I may have forgotten to delete um, the trials where the subject was wrong. I did, right? Because before dropping this column, I should have uh, made sure that we deleted all the ones where correct answer is false. I should have in here uh, deleted the ones. Yeah. I should have had that line in between, but that doesn't change the interpretation because I copied the study from the psychology department and they did that there, and uh, the results were pretty much the same. All right, and then the last thing for this semester, um, just something real quick, parallelism in Python, multi-threading and multi-processing actually. So what we did so far is um, we had a program which was basically linear in time. Every time we had a new, uh, we called a new subroutine, some, some function, um, the calling function stopped until the new subroutine we created returned where well, it worked and then once the subroutine returned whatever I calculated the calling function could do something more until it had to call a new subroutine and so on and so on. So in the in a non multi threaded post program when the thread calls sub so if we have only one thread when it calls a subroutine there's still only one thread of control such that but our original uh, caller must pause until uh, whatever it called uh, is done. 
And if we have a multi-threaded program, what we can do is at every point uh, for the time of our pro the execution of the progress, we can start a new thread, and those threads can work in parallel and end whenever they want to end. And that's something really useful, so why don't we do it at Python? Um, and the problem is that Python is a hard, hard programming language to make, to, to become multi-threaded, because Python has the so-called global interpreter lock. So every time you do something, uh, or you want to do something in parallel, it's not certain that Python does it, that Python actually does it in parallel. It probably does not. Because Python is an interpreted language. So it's not compiled like Java, where you first compile the code to something binary and then execute the binary thing. But Python interprets the code code line by code line. And the problem in Python is that the interpreter is running in one thread. So if you want, if you make your program multi-threaded, because the interpreter is still running in a single thread, your program is running in a single thread. Because even if you make those subroutines and you want Python to execute them in parallel, where the interpreter is going to jump from here, does something here, jumps back here, does something here, they are not really parallel. The interpreter only works in one thread, all the threads you produce is also one in the same thread. So multi threading doesn't really work in Python because of this global interpreter law. What we can do is multi processing. Because in multi-processing, when we spawn different program, um, we spawn different processes, every Python process has its own interpreter, such that where we have for every single process, we have um, one interpreter, and then all processes can really run in parallel. Um, now you may be wondering why does multi-threading even exist if the Python interpreter um, interprets it um, serially anyway. Um, and there is an answer for that that we're going to get to in a second. What's important to know, first of all, is the distinction between uh, parallel and concurrent um, processes. Parallel processes run truly at the same time. They run simultaneously, they, for that they must run simultaneously on different CPU cores. So if you have only a single core CPU, you will never have parallel processes because every CPU core can only do one task at a time. And all operate, so all computers, until the first dual core CPUs came about, executed everything, like only one thing at a time. If you were browsing a website, watching a movie, downloading something, and where your operating system was running with, it's like 50 something uh, processes anyway, none of these actually went at the same time because process can only handle one process at a time. But the, process, but the CPU is really, really fast at switching tasks, which is why it looked like it was truly parallel. However, truly parallel run at the very same time, such that they can only run a different CPU or CPU cores. Then there are concurrent processes, which appear to be parallel in the most ecosystem, even though the CPU may handle them one after the other. So concurrent processes are either parallel or interlocked. And uh, so parallel processes, if we have our time up here, parallel processes are really here, but this interlocked are actually like, this would be something how interlocked would work. So when one one's here, three two one's here, three here, two, three, one. And in the end, it may look the same to your, uh, 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 to your, uh, to the end user, even though they're never one at the actual same time. Okay, and now why um, why multi-threading still works is that CPU intense processes are only truly sped up when they're really parallel, because the CPU can work at them in parallel. Um, there are also tasks which simply have a bottleneck somewhere else than the CPU loading something from the disk, um, waiting for user interaction, loading something from network or something. And those tasks, they're not the CPU is the bottleneck, but something else. And those tasks, actually, concurrent processes are enough. Because it doesn't matter if the CPU actually handles them at the same time. The important thing is that there's nothing which blocks um, this thread uh, or this process 
such that the others are simply waiting for the user input or something. So in class, we have a bottleneck and network where this consists of waiting for users. I have greatly for concurrent execution already, which is something we can do in Python with multiple meddling where we don't even need multiple processing. Okay, so the difference between multi meddling and multi processing. So a process has many information um, for the computer. So first of all, we have the state of the process. If the process is ready, running, and active, or some other states, uh, just a certain number of states the process may have on a computer. Uh, there's some there's a demo thing. So the, the next thing is the program counter. What? So in an interpreted language, for example, in which line are we currently in? What's the next thing we execute? Um, the CPU gives us everything the CPU has cached, which may be variables or something in our program. Um, and also much more, of course, because the CPU will resource us. So this just can only uh, hold so much information. And then the, um, and maybe the registers only contain uh, pointers to um, your RAM of which information of the RAM belongs in this process and so on. Scheduling information, so the, what, the, what our computers are really good at is it's schedule, scheduling because, like I said, if you, have, if you don't have 50 something cores, you have 50 something processes active at every single uh, second of uh, your computer being active, right? These are all processes which are currently active on Microsoft. Well, these are really many processes. Jesus. Um, they appear to be working in parallel, such that you will need to have good scheduling of when the, pro the when the CPU, when the next process of the CPU will, say, what what the next process will be, and every process has scheduling information like how important is uh, this process and what position in the queue does this process have. Storage information, like I said, stuff that's on the web. I always say this: if this process asked for a file to be opened or something. This is all which belongs to the process. And when switching processes now, all those information needs to be saved so that the CPU can launch another process and freeze this one. And it's really extreme because the CPU is like hundreds of times per second it switches its tasks. And before every single task switch needs to save every of these items from the CPU to the RAM, load something new and continue this one, and it still looks fast, and it still appears like no time was taken for task switching. But of course, we can imagine that there is some time which, which the computer took to save this one somewhere else and load a new one. The, pro the problem is that this here produces a lot of overhead. So deleting a process from the CPU and loading a new one, you have to delete and load all this information, and that takes quite a lot of time, which is like threads were created. Threads are simply basically lightweight processes. And the important thing about threads is that they use shared resources. So the storage space, the program code, and all files or virtual files, which as we know in Linux is quite a lot, everything in Linux is basically the virtual file, are shared. OK, so modern operating system these threads to let programs switch control without all the overhead of having to save and load all this information. OK, so switching threads instead of switching processes is obviously a lot faster because it doesn't have to load all of this crap, save and load all of this stuff, um, and load it from the new one. So much faster creation task switching. You can communicate efficiently between threads. You cannot do that in processes because processes, well, they, have, they, they can't communicate with each other because every process is basically a single sandbox, and you can't uh, without using some kind of networking, for example, um, uh, pipes or, of course, uh, TCP uh, uh, or UDP, some kind of, of um, sockets, you can't let processes communicate, uh, but you can uh, let threads communicate. So in programming languages, it's, it's really easy to give information from one thread to the other one, which wouldn't be possible if you had different processes. Problem in threads is, um, Wait, why is that an advantage of threads? Uh, that's a disadvantage, I'm sorry. Um, the problem of threads is that if one thread crashes, the entire program crashes. If you had different processes, that wouldn't be the case. Um, and uh, processes, like I said, so the, the CPU, much of the work of the CPU is actually scheduling. Um, the problem uh, isn't there in threads because the operating system is not responsible um, 
for uh, scheduling threads, it simply schedules the process, and then inside the process, the process itself can decide when which thread comes. So as soon as this process is active, the process can decide which of its threads it now wants to be active, which is really good um, because you can implement your own scheduling for threads inside your process. Yeah, but on the, on the uh, back side of the current, because the operating system doesn't schedule the threads, it's harder to synchronize threads than processes. Um, and then processes are better isolated. Like I said, every process is its own sandbox, and sometimes you want isolation. If you're working with critical data or something, like if you have a, some kind of banking system and you implement the, the uh, activity in different threads, then maybe there's some kind of rivalry which can go from one thread to the other and give bad information to the other thread. Wouldn't be possible really with, um, with processes because like I said, the communication really sucks between processes and processes are better isolated. And yeah, Python can't use threads for really parallel processing, which is why I read it's a huge disadvantage of threads. Okay, let's look at how we do something with threads. So this is just, uh, obviously we see this here is the version which is not leaving threads. So what we do here is we create um, one, wait, how many is that? Uh, one million uh, random numbers a hundred times and then we solve it. So, um, da -da 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 -da. yeah, so 100, uh, one billion times, uh, 100 times we sort one billion numbers using numpy. And then uh, I explained last week, we want to use time the performance counter, right? And then we simply count how long that took, okay? So we start the time in here, uh, we sort, I don't know, this should be in here, sorry. Um, we sort these one million values 100 times and then we count how long they took. And that took six point something seconds if we do this sorting once after the other. And now let's do that with multi, let's do that multi credit uh, and look if that's faster, we still have our um, one million uh, uh, NumPy array. We still sort it, sort it the same way. Um, but what we do now is for every, so all we want to sort it 100 times, and for every single time we want to sort this array, we want to sort an array, we make a new thread. And for that we need the threading module, module and we'll create a threading dot thread, which is that some, which as argument needs some target function, which is this sort of here. And then we, well, we append, so we have a list of these threads. Uh, we append our current thread to this list and we start it. So this here is how we do something multi-threaded in Python. We create a new object of type thread we tell using the keyword argument target what function this thread is supposed to execute and then we call it thread.start. And this simply create, lets Python create a new thread sorting these, so in this case, executing the function we want to execute, in this case sorting these values. And then as soon as we call thread.start, um, Python is going to spawn this thread Imagine this was actually truly parallel. We, we know it's not, but imagine and can imagine it was actually parallel. And then these threads all run parallel. So 100 times in parallel, we saw the list of 1 million values. Um, and then why did we add these threads to a list? Because in the end, we want to join those threads. Joining means that uh, basically waiting for the other threads to be done. So what we see here now. So if we, uh, normally we interpret a program from, from, from top to bottom, right? So we go through all of this, this doesn't take much time, and then 100 times we create a new thread, and create the new thread, and create the new thread. This doesn't take too much time because we simply create a new thread. And if we now didn't join, so joining basically means waiting for the other active threads. If we didn't do that, our program would be done here because when it starts all the threads and then our program is done. And then 
our main program stops and doesn't wait for the threads because why would it? Because our program is done here. Um, to actually let our main program wait for the threads, all we have to do is we have to join, we have to call the method join of every single thread object, which simply waits for this thread to be finished. Of course, so what we do here is we wait for all the 100, 100 spawn threads to be finished, and we get to this line here only after all the 100 threads are done. This is the only thing the join does. The executing, so the thread which called join on another thread, so the main thread here, this is the main thread, called join on every single one of these thread, of thread objects, which means it waits for every single one of these thread objects. Such that we can print the time after all these spawn threads are done. So we wouldn't have this join here, this would take 0.0 seconds or something, and we wouldn't have any information about the sorting action, how long the sorting actually took. But this way we do, and we see if we print the difference in time that doing this thing in parallel only took 1.5 seconds. So even though my threading in Python is not truly parallel on the CPU, we still had a huge, huge time advantage uh, using my threading here. Why that? Because sorting an error is apparently sorting an error is apparently not only a CPU heavy task, but but there's some other bottleneck. Okay, to give uh, a better way of so to explain this in a better way, um, I used an example from this website here. Uh, this one. So this is simply an example of downloading some images from, uh, from, from Imager. Okay, so we need these functions here simply. So this is a function which calls the Imager, 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 right? Imager. Imager API looks at the hot uh, images of this, the viral hot video, uh, images and videos of this month. And this simply gets um, the link of all those images. So this here calls the top five pages from the Imager API and the top six pages from the Imager API. And what it simply does, it, it's, this is how we call APIs, it's not, not relevant for this class, but it's simply this return all images simply returns um, a list of image URLs for the top viral month images on Imager. This is how you work with APIs of other examples from related to this class. Uh, this function here simply downloads um, such a link. So we get many links here for images, and we want to every we want to download every single one individually. And what we do here is where we use the URL open library, uh, URL open from the URL lib library, um, and then such uh, and then we simply download. Uh, we we open binary some uh, the file name which we created here and then simply we write what we downloaded into that file. So we download the image to a disk, and here we simply set up our download here, which would actually be shorter if we use the uh, does exist, can exist keyword argument. But yeah, this is just preparation, so uh, we need a function to crawl the links from an image, download the links from image, and yeah, set that up. Okay, and now let's go for the um, non-parallel version. So what we simply do here is we leave this client ID for the image API. So we take the time here, we create our image API token, ID token, uh, we set up a DOM here, and then what we do is we go to all links, which we got using the get links um, function, um, and download all images just as I think this is at the source. So we get all the links into the list here, and then from, for this list of links, we go to every item of this list of links and use the download link function one of, to download the images one after the other. And then we print how many seconds that took. So we create this list of images and we go through every single item of that and we download every single link, every single um, image, which takes 40 seconds if done not in parallel. Let's look if we can make that faster. And for that, um, I need to introduce the new concept of the queue here. 
Um, like I said, where threads can communicate efficiently, how can threads communicate efficiently? We're using this queue. Okay, so we make a new download worker, which is a descendant of a thread. So this here now is a thread, and if we make a descendant of a thread class, um, that needs to implement this one method, such that we can call it thread dot one. So uh, download worker dot one on it. And what we normally do have in this one method is uh, a simple infinity loop, um, which does something depending on the queue which it gets. So when we create this thread, first of all, when we thread.init, we can also call super.init, just that we um, use the super, uh, the super constructor here anyway. And then we provide that with a queue object such that we have access to the queue here. And this queue here is simply something, a thread safe object, which handles the communication between um, the threads. In every single thread, we can call self.true.get, which waits until there's a new item in the queue. And the item is, as you can imagine here, um, one of these download things. So every item of the list of download things. This here waits for the queue until there is something, um, until there is some new link this thread is supposed to download. Then it downloads this link, which it got from the queue. And then it tells the queue that this task here is done, such that um, the queue knows uh, when the thread was done, because this is obviously an infinite loop. And if there's no link in the queue anymore, uh, we want our program to end, right? And we want all threads, as soon as the queue is truly empty, we want all threads to stop, which is why we can call the self of queue of task done, such that the queue will in the end um, kill all the threads. Okay. And then we basically start with the same thing uh, as before. We need the same client ID. We need to create the download uh, folder. We need to make the list of all the links here. Oh, there's not the uh, ends with um, jpeg or something else in here. This would be a fair comparison. Um, and then we make our queue object which is our new way of communication with our main, between our main thread and the worker thread, as I just explained. And then my laptop has eight CPU cores, um, which is why I can usefully uh, use eight parallel processes. Actually, that's a really stupid choice because they are not parallel processes because they go over top of the block and they could have had any random number in here. But let's just stick with eight. Um, so we create eight of those download workers. We tell them they are demons. And if they are demons, then the main thread can exit even though the workers are still active. So this is just threads have the property daemon. If the property daemon is true, then the main thread doesn't wait for them. Otherwise, um, the main thread does wait for them. So if you set worker of daemon equals false, uh, right in this example, we wouldn't even have to join them because uh, we would have to join them because the main thread would still, wouldn't, would still continue with the process here, but it wouldn't end. Uh, like the process, like it would print this really fast, but the process would end uh, only on, uh, once all other processes, uh, the thread would end only until other, only once all threads are done. Which is not the case if you have the threads of processes, uh, 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 D, right? Yeah, and then uh, we call the start method, which internally um, calls the run method. So calling start on the thread and basically calls the run internally. Good. And then we go through all items of our list of links we had here before and put the uh, download the, the download here and the link, the tuple of download here and link, which we take from the queue here, right? Put it in there. And then magic happens because all threads are now active and go through, go through the queue, ask the queue, hey, do you have a new item? The queue says yes, they download it, and they signal the queue that they're done, they start the loop again, ask the queue if it has a new item, da, da, da. and we have now eight threads doing this basically in parallel, such that well, our idea is that it is really much faster. And if we have um, a queue object, um, we don't even have to join every single thread, but we can simply call queue.join because 
the, uh, the Q nodes are threads, and the thread threads all know the Q, um, such that uh, a computer join this waits for all threads working with the Q. And now, if we print the time, in this case, it should be less than 40 seconds. Yeah, it took 16 seconds. So this is already a lot faster. Um, why is this a lot faster? Even though it's not parallel due to Python's low entropy to lock. Um, well, because here in this task, I always the bottleneck. Uh, the task that takes a long time is downloading the links. Because this here requires opening a website and loading an image or GIF by default, which, depending on your network connection, connection takes quite long. And if we handled all these um, download processes one after the other, um, Python would open this URL, wait until the image is downloaded, do some stuff, open the URL, and, and do some stuff, and then save, save the image, open another URL, wait until the image loaded, and so on and so on. And here, we open eight URLs at the same time, such that, um, so, even though the stuff which happens on the CPU does not work in parallel, the stuff that happens for the network connection can work in parallel. And we have eight images being loaded simultaneously, which is definitely more efficient and faster done than loading one image at a time, such that in the end we are not faster, even though the CPU sees these processes, sees these threads only once, threads only once after the other. I always the bottleneck of this task, the processor so because the CPU is mostly waiting and can pick up a work, working on thread as soon as the network is done, such that we have utilized our network here much better because uh, in the upper version, the network was, so the, the CPU was constantly waiting for the network, and then the network did something, the network did nothing, but the CPU did something, then the network did something, then the CPU did something, the network did something, but the CPU waited, then the CPU did something, and here the CPU doesn't wait for the network, such that um, we are a lot faster in the end. Okay, but this is not helpful for CPU heavy tasks. And in CPU heavy tasks, the execution time, if we use multi-threading, would actually be probably slower. Because um, reasons. Because you can't, you can't, you can never do something uh, in parallel as efficient as you can do um, uh, as, as you can do if you only get it in one thread because we have overhead by creating this parallelism. And the CPU has to work on resolving this overhead, which also takes some time. So if we, if we have CPU-heavy code and we want to speed up CPU-heavy code, we have to use multiprocessing. Um, and this is really, really, so there's something really easy for Python to do that, and that is the multiprocessing module. And the multiprocessing module um, provides us with a pool object and the pool objects provides us um, with the da, 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 with the net function, and this is the really easy and simple way of how to create truly parallel processes in Python. I have to correct this because also didn't copy that here. So what we do for multiprocessing, when we need the multiprocessing the pool object then we do the stuff we did before, we create the list of links here, and now we create a new function, function sort partial. Um, function sort partial simply takes um, a, a function, wait, download link was the function, right? And download deal is here. A function and a variable, and it makes a new function which doesn't need this variable as arguments. So this here, uh, the download, method will have the same signature as the download link method, but it doesn't need its first parameter because this is always the same. This is just an easy way, functions and partials, an easy way of providing basically uh, saturated functions which don't need any arguments. Why that? Because um, the uh, pool.net needs basically a saturated function that only needs one parameter more, which is the link. So let's look at the download link. Da, 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 da. We need a directory and a link argument. We provide the directory, so the only argument we have left is a link, and the pool of map um, 
is easiest, is, is called the easiest way to simply have function argument such that every process can run the same method with simply one different argument. Uh, because what, what we have, like, like I explained before, if we have not multiple threads but multiple processes, this maps to the C function. Um, what was the name of the C function? What was the name of the C function this maps to? Uh, I forgot. But what it simply does here, as soon as you call this function, so this here is your program stage right now. So this here was time linearly. Soon as you fork function, the C function fork, as soon as you call it fork, um, it copies the exact same stuff. Uh, so, if, so if this was your one process until now, as soon as you call it fork, it, it copies, it clones every single um, well, information belonging to this process to another process, such that these process, so, such that there are now two completely equal processes, with the only difference uh, being the process ID. So this here now, the, the child process, is the exact same information, like information, this is what I, uh, like this is all the uh, information the computer has about this. The only difference in the two forked functions, uh, processes, that's the process ID. And then Python, with its pool.map, simply passes to the new forked process one argument depending on, depending on the process ID. Yeah, and what you then do simply is use the context manager pool, with which many process that pool a pool. You, just model, you tell how many processes you have. Now the A makes sense because I have A parallel CPU cores such that. Um, I can maximally have eight truly parallel processes. And then we call the function, um, well, um, we saw this, and we can simply map all the links to one of these processes su such that uh, the multiprocessing dot pool will take all the work of deciding when which process takes which link. Um, and then, yeah, we spawn eight processes, and every eight of these processes eventually gets uh, one of these links. And now, if we execute this, uh, it does it in parallel, blah, blah, blah. And we have a pool of eight workers. If eight workers work in parallel, this should be probably something also around 60 milliseconds because it's faster in the CPU domain, but we have more overhead. Ah, OK, so the overhead is actually really, really this is pretty much. So this here is six seconds slower than the multi-threaded version um, because the computer has really much overhead of forking and creating the new processes here and then switching between these processes, which is why this is not a CPU-heavy task. In this case, threading would be the better option if it was a CPU-heavy task, like, I don't know, just running an algorithm, um, the uh, multi processing would have been the better choice. As much for that. And then there's also a sync and a wait. Um, these keywords also exist in Python. So there's, if you want parallelism, you have the way of going for multiprocessing or multithreading, or you can go for asynchronous programming. Um, so it's simply a different paradigm. Um, and that's simply where the, the idea of asynchronous programming is that you, um, you don't have this one, one main thread which calls function after function, which in turn call function after function after function. But you simply have every, you tell every function, you're synchronous, you don't wait for anything. But once you're done, please call this other function. And this is actually in JavaScript, it's really common to code that way. Um, in Python, it's not the normal way, but you, these keywords also exist in Python. Um, follow this link for an, a difference of comparison between a single weight and uh, multiprocessing. So asynchronous programming and multi-process programming, and an example of how we use async and await actually with this example in Python would be um, at the link where I also took this example from. Um, you can look at it if you want to. Also, yeah, there's something to the sklearn API here. I won't show that a lot of time now anyway. Um, but yeah, then that would be it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah. Everybody who still watches, please do the evaluation. Krass, das war ja noch voll lang. <lacht> Boah, Alter, ich hab. Ey. Sorry dafür, ey. Ich, ich habe auch gemerkt, wie viele Richtschaffel und so da drin waren. Jesus, ey. <lacht> Echt, das <ist> schon. <lacht> ah, Power of Mind auch okay, aber ey, ich war halt von Dienstag bis gestern Abend weg und ich glaube, das ist nicht so. Verständlich. Naja. Aber. Ähm Schön, dass du das, was wir jedes Jahr Themen mit 15 Minuten machen wolltest. Hm? Schön, dass du wieder jedes Jahr der Notebook mit 15 Minuten machen wolltest. Mm, ja, ich hätte das auch sehr viel schneller machen können. Ja, aber es wäre ja schon schnell genug. Das stimmt eigentlich auch. Ich glaube, ich, ich glaube, du musst einfach immer, wenn du sagst, ja, ich brauche ja für eine Viertelstunde, ist einfach mal zwei rechnen, dann ist es etwa passend. Aber guck mal, ganz ehrlich, hier. Ähm also Eskalon ist wirklich, Eskalon ist einfach nur schön, das sind diese schön gezeigten Beispiele und die, die, die Dinge sind immer gleich. Ähm, also das, das wäre wirklich eine Viertelstunde. Auf der anderen Seite, ich habe jetzt auch erst um fünf nach halb oder so angefangen. Ich glaube eigentlich, dass... Aber ja, also man erklärt daran, dass man es immer noch... Ja. Ach ja, Ja, I am done with this. Ja, ich muss Hausaufgaben machen. Was zur Hölle mache ich denn jetzt für eine Hausaufgabe? Die habe ich noch nicht, dafür habe ich keine Zeit.